very warm welcome ladies and gentlemen welcome back to some interesting facts and an interesting session our first session after lunch would be doing things differently in the 21st century adapting to the new landscape and redrawing the blueprint for the next millennium of retail and i would like to invite our anchor suresh venkat former editor technology and special projects cnbc uh, we have a power pack session this afternoon and the theme of the first session is doing things differently in the 21st century to moderate the session i'd like to invite a man who's an expert on doing things differently biju kurian member strategic advisory board l capital asia biju can we have you on stage thanks suresh and a very good afternoon to all you ladies and gentlemen i know this session after lunch is typically the most difficult session to stay awake especially with the largest which has been provided by the organizers so let me let me at least assure you that we will try our best to keep you awake uh, i'm certainly privileged to be able to to chair this panel which has got a whole host of luminaries from different industries different retail backgrounds different culinary backgrounds uh, and certainly i think uh, all of them are obsessed with this one thought what is going to be happening in the 21st century which is different from what happened in the 20th and how are we going to be able to adapt to this you know when we look around the world we all see a host of changes happening around us and these are changes which you might define as earth shaking changes things which have happened in the retail world which we didn't imagine could happen in the past who ever thought that a retailer who did a turnover of a billion dollars in 2000 would actually report a turnover of 71 billion dollars in 2013 it took them only 13 years to get to 71 billion dollars and that's amazon uh, versus the you know the 40 odd years that uh, walmart took before it got to any scale or size so what we actually are seeing is that there are ways in which the retail world is actually getting shaped and reshaped as we live in it we also have seen over the last few years the emergence of facebook what started off as being a platform to connect friends family and now which has turned out to be a larger opportunity for brand engagement and for show windows here again what we are seeing is a social media platform which has turned itself into becoming an integral marketing tool for retailers and brands india has seen lots of changes in retail traditional retail continues to be a very large part of the indian retail market of almost 500 billion dollars yet in the last 20 years we have seen the emergence and green shoots i might say of modern retail so if you were to look at where most traditional retailers are which is in the grocery space you also have modern retailers who started up in the grocery space so the south especially the states of tamil nadu and andhra and karnataka were the birthplace of modern grocery retail and that then has spread across many other countries many other states in this country and with many more players coming into the market exclusive brand retail which is the other form of retail and a lot of us would remember the ubiquitous bata store the bombay dyeing store the raymond store all of these which were basically exclusive brand outlets and today we actually see exclusive brand outlets like zara the likes of h&m coming in brands like tommy hilfiger luxury brands like zenia or burberry so what you are seeing again here is exclusive brand which has actually moved in a slightly different direction wholesale community in india is a community which has thrived where the consumer product industry has often fallen short which is getting product in that last mile to that last outlet in that last town or village and the wholesalers working on small margins of 2 2.5% have actually managed to fulfill that role very well but then come 1999 metro cash and carry 
and we saw the emergence of a new form of retail, cash and carry, but primarily trying to service the small retailers across the country and do what the traditional wholesalers used to do in the past. Then if you were to look at the last few years, we've seen high decibel advertising campaigns, huge launches, large amounts of money being spent, lots of in-your-face advertising from several e-tailers who've made their presence in this country. The biggest of them, of course, is Flipkart. You have Amazon following hotly in pursuit. You've got Snapdeal, which is also making a big mark. So you have them in the B2C format. You have them in the B2B format, where they cater to other retailers. You have them run by the government, like the IRCTC, which is just a brilliant job in terms of creating, of, in terms of doing e-ticketing for the Indian railways. So you have a whole host of retailers who've used the internet as the platform and created a new, new technology of retail. And then, of course, you have those who go door to door, person to person. So if you look at an Amway, you look at Avon, you look at Oriflame, Tupperware. These are, again, retail and distribution models which have relied on peer recommendation and which have relied on the fact that the customer recommending to another customer is probably the best way of marketing your product. So when you look at India retail, you do see a lot of these. And what is most important is that a lot of this has actually happened in the last 10 to 15 years. So barring the likes of a shopper's stop, which probably started in 1992 with the first department store and the first presence in modern retail in India, but if you look at it today, especially over the last 10 years, there's been a large number of players who've come in with various models into the Indian retail market. But yet all of this is what we still define as brick and mortar retail. So whether it's traditional, whether it's modern, it's still brick and mortar retail. It's still about going to a store. It's still about going there and being served by somebody. It's still about picking products off the shelf and going to the cash till and getting it billed and taking it back home. But what we are seeing around us are technologies which are sweeping across this country and sweeping across the world. Technologies which enable you to be able to choose your products wherever there is a telecom signal. Technologies which allow you to be able to sit in the comfort of your home and then transact from your smartphone or your laptop or your tablet. Technologies which enable people to pay on the internet as opposed to physically handling a cash or credit card. Technologies which allow consumers or customers to actually receive their products in a day, wherever they are located. And these are technologies which are redefining the world and redefining the way retail is being run. So in the midst of all of this, what we do have is traditional retailers looking at some of these challenges which are being posed to them by what could be seen as more technology savvy and nimbler e-tailers. What we're also seeing are customers who are now getting used to a new level of service, wherein they believe that it is their birthright to be able to buy at the lowest price, receive it as fast as possible, and if you're not happy, to be able to return it. All of which used to be a no-no as far as brick and mortar retail went in the past. What we're also seeing here are new ways of reaching consumers. What we do realize is that if in the past we believed that the Times of India was our answer to be able to reaching the consumer, today we are seeing that there are other ways of being able to reach consumers. So are you going to be where the consumers are congregating? Are you going to be where consumers are speaking to each other? Are you going to be able to get consumers to talk about what they've bought in the past? 
Are you going to be able to get consumers to be able to express their views about a specific retailer or about a specific brand? And are you going to be able to harness the power of that opinion that the consumer has expressed into a positive statement as far as your brand or your store goes? And I think there are now new ways of communication which have gone away from the one-way street that we used to use in the past of putting an ad in the newspaper and hoping everybody has seen it. Now it's a two-way engagement. It's a two-way engagement where the customer has as much the privilege of talking back to you as you as a retailer has the privilege of talking to a customer. So these are some of the few changes that we have seen in terms of consumer communication. And I think when we look at this as retailers, we are all posed with this question as to if we have done what we have done to reach where we are today, what is it that we need to do today to reach where we want to be tomorrow? And I think we have an audience here, we have a panel here, which hopefully will be able to throw some light on several of the questions that are being posed to them from a business perspective, from the way they run and manage their stores, from the way they actually look at their customers and also communicate with their customers. But before I request them to talk to you, what I'd like to do is to get Suresh, who is the technology expert in CNBC and an old friend of mine, to be able to talk to you about some of those technology things which are happening, which will certainly make a change in our lives and probably have some relevance for retailers and consumers alike. So Suresh, may I invite you on stage? Thank you. So Biju used to be my former boss at Titan, so I need to be very careful about what I say. So I'll measure my words very carefully. I'll speak for very little time and I'll try and say a few meaningful things about technology and about my observations of being uh, in media and journalism over the last 15 years. Observation number one. The science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke said this. He said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. How does WhatsApp, how does WhatsApp work? Magic. How does satellite television work? Magic. How does a signal go 72,000 kilometers into space, bounce off a satellite, and come back 72,000 kilometers by the time you finish one phone call in a nanosecond? Magic. Right? There's a strong element of magic. Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, said, it's called Moore's Law, informal law in technology. He said, the processing speed of any processing system will double once every 18 months. That means every 18 months, throw away a computer, buy a new computer, throw away a phone, buy a new phone. So the Google boys are trying to make that once every six months. That law hasn't changed for many, many years now, and it's unlikely that it'll change, uh, irrespective of how you feel about how fast technology is changing and how things were much cooler in your dad's time and your grandfather's time. They weren't. Three is a concept called the hedonic treadmill. So this answers the question, can money buy you happiness? Can buying new things, new cars, new clothes, shiny new watches make you happy? The answer is yes, but only for 90 days. <laughs> Behavioral scientists, psychologists, and economists have observed a phenomenon called the hedonic treadmill, which is any new acquisition that you make will become the new normal in 90 days. 90 days. Money can buy you happiness, but you have to keep on buying. <laughs> right? So Amazon, so at one point of time when Flipkart said delivery within two weeks, we were shocked, two weeks, really? I must be really privileged to get delivery in two weeks. Then they said, okay, delivery in three days' time. We said, really? Amazon says delivery in one day, and we say, okay, whatever. One full day, really? <laughs> Can't you deliver before I order? Can't you read my mind? So this is the nature of the hedonic treadmill. It applies to retail, it applies to technology, and no matter what you do in technology or in retail, this is going to constantly catch up with you. It's called the new normal effect irrespective. At one point of time, you were happy with the Nokia 5110. The customer moving from one channel to the other seamlessly and creating a consistent brand experience, as Raj had mentioned. When you look at yours, which is an exclusive brand outlet business, how do you see the role of several, several channels in what has traditionally been a brick and mortar channel business for you? I think uh, we are more of a people's brand. 
we call our business uh, social business more than anything else. Uh, obviously, it's about not only looking good, it's about feeling good, doing good. Uh, I think today the world needs uh, a lot of uh, emphasis on socio-environmental issues. And we, the way we did our business in a different way was uh, create a brand where, which is out and out fashion, but at the same time is doing a lot of good to people, to the society, to the environment. And uh, we are truly sticking to our DNA in everything that we do as a brand, our events, uh, our activities, uh, you know, a part of the big portion of our sales goes to, to the welfare for education and healthcare. Uh, but at the same time, we can't forget the fact that today, India is a very fast evolving market as far as retail is concerned. Uh, consumer is well aware. We are one of the youngest nations in the world. And, uh, you know, we are catering to the likes of people who are exposed to modern ways of uh, exploring uh, the various things, whether it's online experience, whether it's smartphones, whether it is uh, going to well-made shopping malls. Uh, uh, seeing a lot of uh, uh, evolved and experienced brands which have been on board for 30 years, 40 years across the globe. Uh, so the environment is, is, is very competitive. Uh, you need to create your own space, own niche in the market. And that's how we came up with the concept of being human. I thought uh, there was no other brand in this country uh, which had uh, the USPs that we had. Uh, it's celebrity, fashion, charity all put together and uh, obviously we are very young retailers it's been one and a half years that we've been in the business but uh, uh, i can proudly say that we've covered a long distance uh, with multi marketing strategies uh, as a brand today we are available with standalone stores we have franchisee model we have we are available on all the e-commerce uh, major players we are uh, we are also tying up with like minded brands who want to contribute, like Suzuki. Uh, we, have, we have one of the first few Indian brands uh, to, to uh, actually venture out, one of the first few Indian homegrown brands which is selling across 16 nations as on today in such a short period, purely because the concept is very unique. Uh, uh, you know, we have a separate line for organic clothing which supports the environment. And also in our stores, we have one of the first few retailers in the country to give a virtual experience to a client when he walks into a store. Uh, I got hold of these uh, young IITians who developed a fantastic software, which is called uh, Match. And uh, it's installed, the, the, these are interactive touch screens which are installed in all our stores. Uh, basically, a client can go and see the whole collection that's available in the store or for the season. Uh, he has a live model of a man and a woman who he can dress them up. He can do mix and match. It, it also captures all kinds of data as far as customer is concerned. He can, uh, like Colleen was saying earlier, the, you know, what he's creating, it's the same experience. He can even WhatsApp it or email it or send it through a social network to his friends, his you know, family to take a suggestion of what they feel. And we've noticed that We've had 8% of sales increase due to this new device that we've put in our stores. So I think retail is all about constant innovation, constant change. Uh, I think uh, it's all about, it's a big whirlpool of ideas. You need to keep innovating and in reinventing yourself. And uh, as closer as you can get to a customer, uh, the more probability of converting that into business. Because today, let me tell you honestly, there is no brand loyalty as such amongst the youth, especially the segment that we are catering to. Uh, what you need to do is, uh, is, is, is go beyond business and engage them uh, through various platforms. For example, the celebrity who endorses our brand, Salman Khan, is, is the highest followed guy in the country. He has more than 25 million followers on Facebook and Twitter and other, other social media platforms. And he's 105th in the world as an individual. So we have to leverage that, uh, we have to leverage that uh, strength. Uh, also, we are a country of 1.4 billion people. I think every fifth person in the world is an Indian and he's in every nook and corner of the world. Uh, and we see that uh, traction coming to us from all over the world because people living abroad who are Indians are more rooted and more Indians 
than we are because for us it's an everyday life, but they miss it more and they're more connected to their culture. And I think we've been able to uh, leverage this whole um, USP of the celebrity, of the brand, of the concept uh, in, in a good way. And uh, we're always constantly looking for loads of innovations. There are people with technology coming to you with lots of uh, ideas and offers and, and we are absolutely open to it. Great. So what we can actually see from all of these stories is I think uh, the clear understanding that these are not just merely single channel retailers. All of them actually understand the power and the opportunity that several technologies and the other channels bring about. So whether it's about making sure that you're able to use the power of your network of stores, like the 300 stores that Metro has, which Rafiq Bai spoke about, and using technology to be able to provide a much larger inventory and choice to the customer than the single store that they're in, or whether, as Manish was mentioning, to talk about communicating with consumers across based on the availability, based on the power of the, the brand ambassador, or looking at impact as being an opportunity to differentiate yourself in an otherwise competitive world. Or if you look at Colleen and you talk about the, the fact that you can actually customize, which nobody else can really do. What you can see in all of these examples are ways in which they've leveraged technology, they've leveraged innovation, they have created competitive advantages which enable them to still present a big fight, if not a victory, over newcomers in this space who are largely in the e-tail space. That's one. The second thing that I think we can all see is that all of them see their roles as being leaders who need to understand what needs to be done in the next five to 10 years in taking their businesses forward and are completely aware of, of the things that need to be done and how those need to be embedded into what they are currently doing in order to grow their businesses. So none of them are actually illiterate as far as new technology is concerned. They're all completely abreast of new technology. I think that's the second thing that they are seeing. And the third is that they all understand the power of the consumer. And I think uh, Ishwar talked about it in his opening remarks about the power of the consumer, the power of, pers the power of, of peer review, the power of being able to make sure that as long as you focus on the consumer and do what is right for the consumer, whichever business you are, whichever technology comes in, you will still succeed. Uh, what I'd like to do is now throw open this... Uh, Biju, I have uh, one more sorry. addition to what you're saying, if I may, before we throw it open. For the benefit of all our younger audiences, I've summarized each of the speakers into one 140 character line. So if you want to tweet this or you want to write it down or just memorize it, I'm going to start with uh, Ishwar Chugani. And the crux of what he said was make the old new. That's the single most powerful thing he said. What, in whatever business you are, if you want your customers to come back to you, make the old new. Ajit Joshi said, merely increasing mobile and broad broadband penetration will not magically in commerce increase e-commerce acceptance. Even in countries like Germany and America, where the penetration is much higher, e-commerce is not much higher. It's not like e-commerce is 95% of the market. Kulin Lalbai said, online is but a new way for customers to seamlessly experience your brand and not just a way to offer discounts or quick delivery. That's an important statement. Chef Sanjeev Kapoor says, food is a constant. The art of making it and selling it keep changing. Rafik Malik says, the principles of a successful business have remained unchanged in the last 40 years and are unlikely to change in the next 40 years. Raj Varman says, technology can be a powerful tool to train your employees and manage your business in real time, not just for the consumer, but for the enterprise as well. Manish Mandana says, you can do business and do good at the same time. And Biju Kurian says, we do not live in an either or world, we live in a both and world. Both real and e-commerce, both click and motor. Thank you. Thanks, Suresh. Thanks for summarizing every single thought so far. <laughs> Great. So, questions from the audience. Please state your name and who you'd like to address the question to. My question is to Mr. Korean, actually. Uh, we have seen traditional stores, then malls, and then online. 
do we see any, anything new which uh, gives a surprise to online also? Stores to malls to online, do we have a fourth player coming in? Oh, what's next? We went from stores to online to mobile, what's next? Thought control perhaps. Are you wanting to ask it as stores to malls to online to or stores and malls and online? Would you like to restate your question? Because there is, it means two different things. So actually, uh, no, I think, I don't think it is two. That's my view. Uh, I, when you say stores to malls to online, it seems to be generational shifts. I think what we need to understand is that in a country like India, when we talk about stores, it's new to somebody who's living in rural India. Inasmuch as malls are new to somebody who's living in small town India, Inasmuch as, you know, online is new to more than the 150 million people who are otherwise connected or the 30 million people who all, you know, normally transact on the web. So I think, you know, when you look at it, it's not that you can actually look at one model for India. We have several models because India is comprised of several segments and we cannot look at the same model serving the needs of all Indians. So I think to that extent, I think it's about and and not on. That's, that's the way I see it. Could I also take, take a stab at that question? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, since we were confused about who's supposed to answer, let me also try and uh, give an answer. Um, I think um, if you look at a market like the US and you look at the late 90s when e-commerce started shaping several segments like books and electronics, you saw the pure play guys really build the, the business and create the entire ecosystem. They are the guys who led the adoption curve with the customer. And it was only after five to six years that some of the incumbent traditional businesses started understanding the power of the segment. And what happened over the next five to six years is that you, were, you saw the birth of brick and click um, retail. So if you look at the lifestyle category, and you look at a country like America, it's not just an Amazon-led model. You have flash sites like in Idly, you have a Gap.com, you have an Abercrombie.com, you've got a luxury-focused uh, brick-and-click model. The market really segmented and started moving towards seamless retail. So I think there is, India has been through a couple of waves. The first wave was the Indian e-commerce. Now the global guys are coming and they're going to fundamentally reshape e-commerce. And then at some point, you will see the traditional houses also coming and bringing in a new kind of model. It might not be the same choice, discount, and high amount of access. It might be slightly different, but I do feel that at some point, India will also see um, seamless retail, omni-channel retail take off. It might take a couple of years, um, or it could even be sooner than that. My question to Mr. Sanjeev Kapoor, uh, he's a celebrity chef uh, in the whole country, outside also. But uh, he's a celebrity in, at my home also uh, because of uh, certain program on food and food and other channels. Uh, can you elaborate? Uh, the fast food is getting uh, very popularity and uh, uh, the children's and uh, new generation. Uh, how can you elaborate the traditional and healthy food to fast food industry and what is your advice to the new generation and the future generation uh, of India? Uh, can you give the advice uh, how can they take the fast food and how they can become fast food to healthy food? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think the question is in the definition and the answer also is in the definition. Uh, need is uh, at two levels. I think uh, today's generation need everything is moving very fast. So we need food that can be served fast, cooked fast, prepared fast. However, fast food has a, a very bad uh, meaning in uh, everyone's mind, the way it is defined. Uh, I think we need to answer that need. Any food, if planned well, can be served fast. 
सो ट्रेडिशनल फूड हेल्दी फूड एनी फूड वी जस्ट नीड टू फोकस सो होम स्टाइल फूड if we plan better if we plan uh, how to shop if we just make one simple thing everyone does it at home make a weekly menu of things that would be cooked we just don't do it every day all households just before couple of hours before meal this question is there acha ab kya banaye sham ko kya khaoge why can't you make a menu just do it a weekly menu and just this simple thing can change everything and start cooking more at home sorry i know we run restaurant businesses but uh, i i think that will answer uh, a big problem where people are looking at uh, healthier options so i would say that even so called fast food if you cook at home it would be healthier than anyone uh, else when it is available in the market i can tell you this sure sorry raj <laughs> you almost did well there till the end <laughs> but i forgive you <laughs> uh hi a question for manish uh, you talked about uh, being human and a social brand and uh, commitment to environment and stuff so and i appreciate i mean what you have actually done for uh, uh, uh being a brand with with kind of uh, a broader uh, uh, uh giving back to society do you you think also your brand actually should contribute to something to the farmers per se which is the cotton farmers which is the majority of the product you use given the distress in india i mean is there something you are planning on those lines as well uh, honestly there are lots of initiatives uh, that the being human foundation takes up mm -hmm. uh, obviously the world needs to to change a lot in many which ways but we focused on education and healthcare as a prime uh, area where we want to really invest uh, all our funds into so right now uh, in the scheme of things it's these two things that we are really focusing on i mean we are also uh, i mean we've tied up with a lot of organized ngos run by really respectable people and supporting them uh, i think this could be one of the future endeavors that we want to do uh, for example we did a uh, you know we in vidarbha there was a big drought uh, drought in the farm farmers and and they had uh, huge issues we we supplied water tanks with uh, with uh, regular water supply to them for almost 3 months and that's what we did so there are various social initiatives that we take up uh, even our loyalty program that we've started uh, it's a loyalty program with a difference where uh, if a consumer is is uh, gaining points uh, into his card uh, he has a choice to 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 donate amount out of it or even redeem by by buying something so we call it 100% share uh, so yeah we try to put that aspect of uh, goodness in everything that we do the paper that we use is recycled we avoid use of plastic you know loads of things everything around the brand is only about socio environmental uh, aspects so yeah this could be one of them in future i don't know maybe we can support them by buying fair trade cotton you know that's how you can support uh, farmers yep. Yep. thanks appreciate that thank, thank you. you uh hello everybody this is adit chauhan i'm uh, i'm working for a mall in pune my question is uh there are a lot of retailers uh, of course big retailers of india sitting here uh, as a mall you know if if we would like to utilize the digital medium and help our retailers what could be i, I wouldn't really know whom to direct the question to but what could be the things that a mall can do wherein we can help the retailers through this medium and of course help them uh, get better footfalls and uh, hopefully better sales that's a question for you biju uh well i think uh, you know it, it works two ways uh, consumers will come to malls because of their tenants who are in malls okay and retailers come to malls because of the fact that they think the malls well located and can serve a potentially large catchment around it so it's a bit of a win win situation for both people because i think we need to understand that clearly if we don't have this partnership between malls and retailers it won't work now having said that the next point is how do you popularize it what you would typically like to do 
is to be able to make sure that every single shopping opportunity that the consumer has for themselves, they should exercise the shopping option within your mall. So to that extent, you're always looking for what you normally define as the ideal tenant mix, which is somebody who's doing a supermarket, food and grocery, electronics, fashion, services, eating, entertainment, all of that. And that's how you classically build up the tenant mix in a mall. Uh, and what is important is to make sure that each of these tenants have got something to offer. So what you might define as your tenant is actually a retailer of a product or a service has got something to offer. And you are located within a certain catchment which has got a potentially large number of people who can come to the mall. So I think it's the role of the mall to make sure that the offers of the tenants are communicated to the potential customers who live in your catchment. That's the first role. And that's where typically you would use digital media to understand who are those people who live in your catchment how do we make sure that you have a communication going with them? And how do you finally translate that communication into something which has some benefit for that consumer? Second thing is, I think, in terms of understanding that catchment better. And a lot of retailers want to know who are the people who are coming into that mall? How many people who are coming into that mall are actually coming into my store? If that person is spending 100 rupees on fashion, how much of that 100 rupees spend is actually happening in your mall? and how much is going into some other place. If it's going somewhere else, why is it going somewhere else? So there's a lot of information and knowledge that you want to gain about the customers in that space, which will also help the tenants slash retailers in your mall to obviously sharpen their offering and sharpen the communication in order to get more of the spend that is happening in that catchment. And so like this, you know, but I think if you look at it, there are several other things that you can do. But if you primarily do, do these two things, which is establish a communication platform with the catchment population, communicate with them and understand them better. I think there will be a lot that you can do in terms of digital marketing. So it translates into having a mall website, you know, trying to create interactivity there, trying to create mall customers as opposed to store customers. You know, stores have their own loyalty program. So there are a variety of things that you can do around all of this. Vijay, I'm sorry to cut you short. That has to be the last question because I think we are running out, yeah, of, we're time, running out so. of time. I'll try to make it good. Uh, so going with the theme of the panel around um, sort of what are transformational changes uh, that are coming up uh, in Indian retail, a uh, couple of observations from the, from the panel. One were that obviously you are now serving a very young audience when it comes to retail. I think the point was made that India has sort of an average age of 27, 28 in terms of consumers, one of the youngest markets uh, in the world. Number two is, um, you know, you've all identified technology as a transformational trend in all of your businesses. Now, the, if I look at the panel, and this is not a criticism, it's more of an observation, uh, with the exception of Colleen, most of the other gentlemen would be categorized as gray hair to a certain extent. And, it, and it, you have, I think between all of you, you have tremendous years of experience. The question that I have is more from a talent management point of view. When, when you are designing retail experiences for a younger customer, uh, and when you are actually uh, well, well versed in Indian retail for the last 40 years, how do you manage talent? How are you able to attract the right talent to actually create the experiences for, for a younger audience? Uh, especially given that traditionally India has been a culture where you know, being experienced has been valued more than kind of being innovative and disruptive. So how do you manage the talent pool that underlies the innovation that you need to create the experiences that you talk about? Let's ask Rafik Malik that question. Yeah, actually, the, the question was more for, for the folks with the most experience, so Mr. Chagani yeah. and Mr. Let's Malik. Let's ask Kupi. the veterans on the panel. Yeah. So, Rafik, all yours. I think, you know, we find one of the major challenges that we have is that, you know, we have customers who are technology immigrants and customers who are technology natives. And this is a very clear-cut way in which, you know, our customers are behaving. The ones who are technology natives who are born, uh, born with the tablets and the internet and all that and the mobile phone, have a totally different way of doing things and thinking things, experiencing things. And the immigrants have, are still a little wary about technology, you know, how to use it using the credit card. So it's very important to understand. And I think the challenge is very similar when we have stores, I mean, if I'm selling in Chennai, it's very important for me to understand that in Chennai I can sell a lot of white men's shoes, I can't sell white women's shoes, in 
uh, Punjab, I have to sell 14 colors for women. In um, Calcutta, the same shoe, I have to sell a two-inch heel. In Bangalore, the same style, I sell in a four-inch heel. So it's very, very important for any retailer to understand his consumer. And obviously, you know, when you're talking about a younger consumer, he's far more homogeneous. So it's very important and it's really, it. I mean, when I'm looking at my brick and mortar stores and seeing what is selling there, I mean, a store in Gardco, but it's so easy to understand. But I'm looking at the website and I'm looking at thousands of pin codes and seeing what is selling well, it's quite a revelation because now I'm addressing a totally different constituency. But it's the same thing, understanding the consumer, understanding how he thinks, what sort of experiences uh, um, make him happy. And obviously I have to take the help of my young daughter sitting in the audience to be able to understand how they think. But it's really understanding the consumer and that's very, very important. Uh, and I think the point he was also trying to get to was in terms of talent, how do you then finally ensure that you create talent which can handle a lot of these things? You know, we, we have obviously a, you know, at one, on the one stand we have a, a, a deluge of talent and the other hand we also have a paucity of talent. And I think the, the, the trick is in being able to take the deluge and convert it into relevant talent in an industry which currently is going through technology changes. So maybe, you know, some, some, some highlights on that could be useful. I mean, in the uh, way you look at your people in the store, yeah. the way you train them, See, how do you get them? 80% of our managers are people who have come, become managers who started in a company as stock boys. Obviously, the level of education is not very good. But, you know, once we've got them in the DNA and we spend a lot of time and effort in trying to educate and train them. And I think that is where you know, companies will need to invest time in educating people. And once you've done that, we find that the attrition rate that our company has is among the lowest in the industry because these people have grown and advanced and graduated and have come up. And, you know, if you train them well, I mean, today we are looking at so many different ways of even employing, um, you know, um, people with uh, ability challenges and incorporating them in the stores. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity to develop people, develop their skill sets. And retail is a wonderful industry where we can mold and develop people. They need to be people with the inherent liking of being people-oriented people. And then it's important for the company to invest in developing and training them. It's an old answer. That doesn't change. Find good people, train them. That brings us to the end. Thank you very much, Biju Kurian, Raj Varman, Rafik Malik. Manish Mandana, Colin Lalbai, Ishwar Chugani, Chef Sanjeev Kapoor, and Mr. Ajit Joshi. Thank you all very much. May I hand it back to Pamela.